morning. Holy and gracious God, center us in this space. Help us to hear your word this morning as we wrestle, yes, even wrestle with our weird relationship with money. Call to us, God. Speak to us your wisdom, what you would have us walk away with this morning, that we be challenged to start anew tomorrow and the day after in your love and gratitude. Amen. Wow, what a weird relationship we have with money, right? Maybe you all have good, wonderful relationships with money. That's not necessarily where I come from. (laughs) Maybe at some point in your life you've wrestled with this. But I would gander that many of us are in this weird, awkward space. And I can tell by your postures that you're really geared up for a fun time with me today, right? Yes! We're excited to talk about money for five weeks and stewardship for five weeks. Five weeks? Really? Five weeks, indeed. Sometimes money gets a lot of power and control over us and over others in our lives. It can be the hero or the villain in the story. It can destroy friendships and families. It can serve as a protagonist. It can serve as comic relief at times. Money can be very dangerous as an object, a subject, and an idol. Be careful about those idols that we have, friends. In my eight years of ministry as a pastor, I've seen people use money to do some pretty great things and not so great things. In our culture, it's not odd to experience such divides when a beloved family member passes away, causing rifts between brothers and sisters and multiple generations of families. Some of us may have witnessed this firsthand. It happens far often than not as a clergy person that I get, I witness this. In the midst of grieving the loved one, we quarrel over the stuff that is left behind. The things that we thought would be ours, and perhaps they are, perhaps they are not, based on the clarity of the estate plans of the deceased. I've seen people help their neighbor out by providing groceries for a week, a month, two months, because they were in a position to be able to be generous with their money in that way. I've witnessed pe- where, times where people have purchased tires anonymous, anonymously in the time of a great need for somebody. I've watched people, of course, cut up credit cards, throw them away, and never return to that life of debt. I've seen people who won't look at someone if they don't have the right clothing on for an event or even as they come in to worship or even if they don't drive a particular type of car. Some of us have even attached how much money we have in our bank with our self-worth. If we have money, we find that we feel good about ourselves and if money is tight, we find Perhaps that we start perceiving the world a little more negatively, and even ourselves. I wonder, is a low or modest income a source of embarrassment? Have we made it that way in this world? Some of us may even think that money doesn't matter at all and perceive it as a tool for encountering the world. A tool. Some may think that our money and our possessions are everything to us, that they buy us power and control over people and situations that we might not consider elsewise. Money and power go together. There is a real relationship between power and the sense of self-worth as well. Do we ever use money to control people or events? Do we use our money to make things happen the way that we want them to happen? Do we ever use money simply to give others the freedom to do what they want to do with it? How do we feel when we 
when people ask us for money? Perhaps raising some of these questions, in raising some of these questions, you found yourself beginning to feel the tension around this topic that makes our relationship with money complicated and weird. Money is something that can be a pain, but is meant to be a tremendous blessing for how we live our lives as disciples of Jesus Christ as we build God's kingdom here on earth with all the resources that God has blessed us with. In the context of the church, money is a difficult topic to address. So much so that these are sermons that clergy and often congregants dread the most. Right? Mm Mm-hmm, yeah. Remind me that you're with me, please, friends. And I'm sure you're real excited that I said five weeks. So please continue to come back. There is much to be learned here, and there is much for us to wrestle with. It's interesting to me that one of the things that Jesus talked most about, how we deal with our money and our stuff and the things we possess are things that we often only spend three weeks talking about in the life of the church. Think about that. How backwards is that? Usually, on average, three weeks, five weeks is a generous extension that you're getting. In Matthew 6, Jesus speaks out to the crowd and challenges them to not store up treasures on earth, but treasures in heaven. I know you've heard that verse every, probably just about every stewardship campaign. Do not store up treasures for yourself, but in heaven. He says, for where your treasure is, there your heart lies also. Does our relationship with stuff cause us to love our stuff more than God's ways for us to live? Do we put our heart's desires on human value or godly value? Do we acknowledge that above all else we are loved just the way we are with whatever resources of income, and whatever sources of income we have, whatever resources we have access to, God loves us just as we are. It seems that in our human relationships, our human relationship with money could use some restoration and reinvigoration, some wrestling with various elements in order to live into a more Christ-like, more loving and caring relationship with how we steward these resources that come from God including the use of our time, our talents, and our treasure. We're reminded in the first chapter of Genesis that all that we have comes from God, our creator. The birds, the cattle that say what, Eliana? Moo. The fish that go bubble, bubble, bubble. God creates all these things and then creates humanity. All created good in God's own image. And you know what? Money didn't exist then when God created. God didn't create money. We created money. Hmm, there's something to sit with. So how can we consider even even consider tying that to our self-worth? God created all of creation and said that it was good. God also created us, humanity, to tend to care for all of those resources. We can even find examples today of how we have done this well and where we've fallen short. In the life of the church, we're given many words to talk about our relationship with money. They, too, are somewhat weird if you're not familiar with them and if you didn't grow up attending church. And it's probably not even enough to say church because some of these words are... um, Every church has different histories with them, right? Uh, So before we dive further into this series, we've got to make sure our language is similar. So when I say stewardship, as Mark began unpacking in children's time, or our time with Mark, 
Stewardship and how we refer to it is the way that we utilize, manage, oversee the things for which we are responsible for in this life. That includes not just our financial resources. It's our energy and our time, our natural talents, and our spiritual gifts. Note that I said that those are two different things. What comes naturally are not always spiritual gifts, and spiritual gifts are not always talents. But we all have them to be able to use for God's glory in this church, in this community, and throughout the world. Now, the, the, fun, the fun word, tithing. Tithe comes from a Hebrew word that means a tenth. Right? One tenth. And it's a tenth of not what's left over at the end of the month or after we paid our bills. It's a tenth of everything that we give, we get, everything that we receive, pre-tax even, would be the way that we talk about that in the world. Yep, that makes us really uncomfortable, doesn't it? That's what we talk about when we talk about tithing. It's the first fruits of our labor, the first fruits. And I'm going to give you another one that has changed in the last four years, four or five years, since we became one conference, we adopted new language. So the United Methodist Church used to be Detroit Conference in Michigan and West Michigan Conference, and you have always been a part of Detroit Conference, and you would travel to Adrian if, if you had that opportunity to go to annual conference. At that time, the word that you would use was apportionments for our giving to the United Methodist Church, right? Does that sound familiar to people when I say apportionments? What about if when I say ministry shares? That's still new language. So when we became one conference, we adopted the language ministry shares to, to change from apportionments because apportionments is a very churchy word that no one knows what it means unless you've been in church forever. Whereas ministry shares empower us to share in ministry. And now you might ask, who are we sharing in ministry with? Come on, who are we sharing in ministry with? Yes, who are we sharing in ministry with? This is our contribution to give back to the denomination, to the conference, to the world, in our connection of the United Methodist Church in participating in our ministry shares, which equate to about 10% of a rolling average of our last four years of expenses. That might be a new thing to you, because some of you have thought historically that that was based on membership. Eh, not anymore. It's based on a rolling average of four years of expenses, a percentage of that. There's some other numbers, calculations, but what it equates to on average is about 10% of our expenses are, are meant to be given back to the United Methodist Church. Think about it as our tithe to be United Methodist. That's kind of loosely how I frame it. When we give our ministry shares back, the things that we support include Africa University to help leaders in Africa be theologically trained to be pastoral leaders. The World Service Fund, which I, if memory serves me correct, is also the blankets that we used to pull out when I was a child, probably 20, 30 years ago, right? That's World Service Fund, if that's connected. So we give to that through that, through ministry shares. The Black College Fund, which supports, again, scholarships for black people to go to school, interdenominational cooperation fund, funds that specify, have a purpose to do interdenominational activities. The Episcopal Fund, we assist paying for our bishops together as United Methodist Churches. And the General Administration Fund, which make up funds that pay for the other agencies and organizations of the United Methodist Church, like UMCOR, um, like 
I, could, I can't say the United, uh, the discipleship ministries, all of the things that support the larger United Methodist Church that exists, all of these things are our connection to our denomination. And the largest part of these funds then, in addition to that, of those funds, roughly 40% stay in Michigan to support our conference staff that support our United Methodist Churches in Michigan. So how that plays out is uh, we have staff members that focus on children and youth ministry that Mark has been in connection with calling you out because it is. The, the church in the pandemic, the, our conference has been very generous. We've received breaks in pension payments. We've received, we've had the opportunity to receive grants the bishop and other congregations have worked collaboratively to provide videos when this, in that horrible time when we were stuck at home worshiping online only, providing avenues for churches, especially ch smaller churches who couldn't figure out how to uh, stream their musicians as beautifully as we do here, and that you learned how to do. Not all churches had those resources, and our conference was marvelous in helping to make sure that that became a reality. And so you might wonder, like, where are we at with that? How are we doing in paying our ministry shares? And I'd offer this purely as a piece of information for you. The last update that I received is we were around 30% paid for the year. A piece of information for you to sit with and pray about. More information will be coming on the, in the nature of where we're at, but that's a piece that's important because it's a vital aspect of who we are as United Methodists and the ministry that we do near and far and the ministry that we receive from our conference as well. I'm going to give another word uh, that's out there that we're going to continue to talk about is pledging. We all are familiar, perhaps, with the commitment cards that you get every year for stewardship campaign, and I'm sure every year you're invited to take them home with you and spend time in prayer about what your commitment, your financial commitment to the church is. In some churches, that's often used as a baseline to plan the future year of ministry and work collaboratively alongside of a budget, there's another word, so we can dream about ministry and plan accordingly with the commitments that we have. Sometimes in churches we find that due to our expenses and our budget and our commitments, they don't always line up, and so then we start talking about deficits and shortfalls and all of that stuff. Commitment cards are important to help us have a realistic number about what your commitment is to the life and ministry of the church, the future of making disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world, alongside of other churches in this area, including our sister church over in Otisville. In the upcoming weeks, you're going to get a letter with a little more explanation and a commitment card, and you'll be invited to bring that commitment card back. But I want you to begin praying about what your involvement in this ministry of your time, your talent, and your treasure is going to be in the upcoming year. This is not just a thing that we do because we do it every fall. This is a spiritual practice, friends, a commitment to God and our neighbors that we're invested in staying in this community to make an impact, to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with all who do not know it. We could talk about the general fund and designated funds and the endowment, and we can get weighed in all of that, weighed down in all of those words. But in a nutshell, the general fund is where all the money comes in for the church that isn't flagged for a specific purpose. All designated funds, thank you, counters, for nodding your head. <laughs> All of the things that you specify for a specific area of ministry in this congregation, there are a lot of buckets <laughs> that we can put money. Uh, and that's a gift, too, in and of itself. You're a very generous congregation, and that's a blessing to be here, to be a part of that ministry. Things like memorial funds, things like, um, I'm going to have you shout out a few others that I'm not thinking of, building fund. Uh, what did you just say? Camp fund, yes, that's a good one. Annuities, youth and youth missions. What other designated funds are we aware of? You gotta shout it loud. 
there's probably more, which is an opportunity for us to continue educating one another and bringing out some of that stuff so that we know what exists for us to do ministry with and to empower people to go to camp, empower people to get involved with youth and mission. It's a wonderful thing to have these pockets of money that we can utilize for furthering God's kingdom. Amen? Amen. It is a gift. And we have a beautiful endowment. And we need our endowment folks to tell that story. And neither of whom are, I don't see Jerry and Harlow is probably online with along with Sally. <laughs> but yeah, Jerry's not here. Jerry and Kathleen aren't here either to, to nod to that. But they would be excellent folks. If you want to know the history of the endowment, reach out to them. I know somebody else is here that's involved with that as well. But um, we'll get an update on those funds out to everybody before the end of the year as well. So you're aware of the financial status of the church and how you can be involved, not only from a financial aspect, but prayers, presence, gifts, witness, service. The charge conference season also reminds us that that time and talent piece is important. And the nominations committee met last week. Some of you already know this because you've had phone calls. Yep, right? Yes, big smiles on your face. Be in prayer about where you can invest your time and energy, again, for those committees here at church. Talking about money has become even more taboo in society as of late. It's hard to do it without grumbling as the cost of things go up and up and up. Yet Jesus and Scripture tell us a lot about how we should manage money and stuff in our lives. How we manage the resources in our lives reflects our relationship with God. Let me say that one more time. How we manage the resources in our lives reflects our relationship with God. Do we put our trust in God when things get tight or trust God will empower us to re-envision our personal lives and realign them so that the resurrection, so that resurrection might happen? When is the last time you have taken a personal assessment of your own financial picture? I wonder when we each took that time to review the things that we spend money on and questioned if they were needs or if they were things that we thought we needed to increase our self-esteem, our self-image to the outer world, or because we might have a fear of missing out on something. How might our personal finances be different if we evaluated each of our spending habits through the eyes of what is a need, what might be bringing us joy, what is weighing us down and preventing us from doing the work of God with our time, our talent, and our treasure? Our human world has been flipped from what God intended it to be. Some look at the passages in Genesis as a way for a way for us to give ourselves power over all of creation, power over one another. Yet God intended us to live harmoniously with creation, caring for it with all of our resources. And Jesus talks to the Pharisees about looking at some of the ways that they encounter their lives and spiritual practices just differently in Matthew 23, 23. He challenges them to consider not just to write their check each month because it's the right thing to do. He challenges them to consider the ways which those gifts bring about God's kingdom, bring about justice, mercy, and faith. Think about that as your tithe, friends. If you think instead of writing your check to the church, think about it, how those gifts, imagine how those gifts contribute to the work of God's justice, mercy, and faith in this community. Have we flipped the intent of what God intends for us to do with all that God provides us with? Friends, over the course of the next five weeks, we are not going just, whew, we are going to be continuing to explore our weird relationship with money as we ponder some questions and explore some statements about what it means to be stewards to the resources that God provides each of us with. 
As we begin this journey together, I'd love for you to ponder along with me. What is the place of money in your life? Do your bills, your human desires dictate how you spend, or does your faith? How does money enable you to be a faithful, to be faithful in your discipleship? How does it hinder it? Do you allow money to run your life, or do you allow God to help you prioritize your life? Can you identify how your gifts of time, talent, and treasure are actively transforming the world today? Might you consider that the gifts you bring each day are a legacy to the future disciples of Jesus Christ? And as you begin to consider these questions, I wonder how you might recommit yourself to these practices in the weeks ahead. In the upcoming weeks, you will receive a letter with a commitment card. I want you to begin praying today, though, about what that commitment might be for you, what it might mean as well for you, your faith journey, your family unit, and how it might transform your life by taking it as a different approach this year. How might you stretch yourself, increase your faith, and trust in God to bear fruit from challenging yourselves to consider the first fruits that God blesses your family with to be utilized in the ministries of this faith community? Our generosity flows out of gratitude for what God has done, what God is doing, and what God will continue to do with what we give in collaboration with the gifts of others. This is how we live as resurrection people, trusting that God is bringing new life, trusting that through our contributions, perhaps even our sacrifices, through realigning our finances, that God will create good, that our faith will grow stronger and our lives become more aligned with the kingdom work of loving our neighbor. I have found personally that as I have dialed my own finances in, that God blesses me in ways that I would never expect. If I were not looking at that information and prioritizing my finances through a kingdom priorities, I have found that in years past, when I take this seriously, my bank account feels less like a stress trap. And I'm looking forward to how God will use this dialing in these next five weeks to create opportunities for me to bless the church and our neighbors more abundantly. And I hope that you will join me in this endeavor. Set aside some time beginning today to start thinking through this journey for yourself these next five weeks. Our call as faithful disciples of Jesus Christ is to prayerfully consider the ways which you, we use our time, our talent, and our treasure, the way we steward these things. What we do with these three things is an act of worship and gratitude for all that God is doing and will continue to do. We are called to engage fully, trusting that the amount of time, talent, and treasure that we give will serve the needs of the people who will be blessed by it. And in return, we pray that we too are blessed. When we spend time assessing where God is in the midst of our human priorities, our human needs, within the context of our finances, we might find that our heart and our treasure may need to be realigned or retuned. How might wrestling with these things help us to have a less weird relationship with our money? How might it become fruitful in the weeks ahead? May the journey ahead be one of wrestling. May the journey ahead be one of hope. And may the journey ahead be one of resurrection and new life. Amen.